Ahoy there, and welcome ye to Tabletop Ferox. And in this episode, I be looking at the second playtest for Project Black Flag. And uh, I will not be doing the rest of this video as a pirate. That is one of those things that is not funny enough to be worth the effort. So, uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to be looking at the second playtest packet for Project Black Flag, the new core fantasy role-playing game from uh, Cobalt Press, which uh, came out of the recent Dungeons & Dragons controversy uh, that most people have just kind of forgotten about by now. But uh, I haven't forgotten, and uh, I know all of my lovely viewers have also not forgotten, because I just keep reminding you. Anyway, this playtest packet features the fighter and the wizard, which are historically two of the least interesting classes in D&D. And I'm just going to preemptively uh, address your argument. Wizards are not interesting. Spells are interesting. And in this one of two video, I will be looking at the fighter, because... Honestly, by the time I had finished discussing the fighter, the script was already seven pages, and I just didn't want the video to be too long. However, before I get into the fighty boy, there is one other important thing in this playtest packet. They have explained the luck system, which was offhandedly mentioned in the first playtest materials. So basically, the way it works is you now have luck points, and you can add those luck points to a d20 roll on a one-to-one -one basis, or spend three of them for a re-roll. And the points are awarded for things like good role-playing, clever solutions, or overcoming difficult challenges. You know, the basic extra reward type stuff. Although they can also be earned once per round when failing an attack roll or save. Characters can have up to five luck points at a time, but at such point where you would gain a sixth luck point, your total luck points reset to 1d4. And overall, I do like the system. They have stated that it is intended as a replacement for the Inspiration system, which uh, Wizards of the Coast still don't really know what to do with, especially in 6th edition, where the AI Dungeon Master won't really be able to assess and then reward players for role-playing their characters' personality traits and flaws. But this I do like much better than the Inspiration System because the advantage is a big bonus, and getting these little one-point bonuses is a bit more of a manageable thing. And yes, managing all those points might seem like a bit of a hassle, but I think it is one of those things that is really only as complicated as you make it. Like, if you are insisting on writing down and erasing every single point as they are earned and spent, then yeah, it's going to be a cumbersome experience, versus just, like, having five tokens. However, I do have a complaint here, and it is kind of a big complaint, and that is the resetting to 1d4 when you would get a sixth luck point. Because, like, I understand what the point is here. It is to prevent players from stockpiling their points and, you know, making them spend them. However, I feel that just having a limit of five does that. Players get five points, and then at a point where they would get a sixth point, they just don't. They do not receive a benefit, but they're also not being punished for not spending their points because this really seems like the sort of thing that would create a situation where when you have five luck points, you're going to be very cautious about doing anything that might earn you another one. And when the things that can earn you luck points include role-playing and problem-solving, it's going to encourage a certain type of player who we are all familiar with to just withdraw from those elements of the game as soon as the result of doing so switches from a reward to a penalty. But now on to The Fighter, which, uh, spoilers, is heavily restricted in design because of the asinine decision to try and be 100% backwards compatible with 5th edition. 
which is a thing that I discussed in length in the previous video. I believe the phrase chaining themselves to the rotting corpse of the dragon game may have been used, uh, so I will not be getting into that in this video. Also, the classes presented here only include eight levels, although it is, of course, specified that there will be 20 levels in total. Although, personally, I'd kind of be in favor of only eight classes. Um, you know, if not for that thing I just mentioned, which makes fixing large issues with the game kind of impossible. So with that in mind, the fighter basically has analogs of all of the 5th edition fighter abilities at the same levels. Hit dice, proficiencies, and equipment are all the same, except that your saves are now constitution and strength or dexterity instead of constitution and strength. Instead of second wind, you now get last stand, which is activated as a reaction when being reduced to half hit points or lower, instead of being activated as a bonus action, and allows you to heal yourself by spending a number of hit dice up to a maximum equal to your proficiency bonus, instead of healing yourself 1d10 plus fighter level hit points, and recharges on a long rest instead of a short rest. So, overall, uh, it is a more powerful version of the ability, but a more restrictive version of the ability. Like, you can potentially have more healing and an easier activation, but can now only use it once per day, and also have to spend your hit dice to activate it. So it's kind of like the 4th edition uh, Second Wind, except not as stupid. Healing surges were really stupid. Like, if you didn't play 4th edition, you do not understand just how stupid healing surges were. And next up, we have the martial action, which replaces fighting style. And there are four martial actions provided here. First up, we have aim, which replaces archery and allows you to specify a target as a bonus action and then get double your proficiency bonus on your next attack against that target before the end of your turn, versus a straight-up plus two bonus to range attacks. Then Guard, which replaces both Defense and Protection, and allows you to, once again, specify an enemy, giving it disadvantage on the next attack it makes against you, or a creature within five feet of you. So, basically combining the two into one as opposed to Defense, which was just a straight-up plus one bonus to AC, and uh, Protection, which allowed you to impose that disadvantage on an attack, but only against another creature within five feet, not yourself. Then Quick Strike, which replaces two-weapon fighting and allows you to make an attack with a light melee weapon as a bonus action and add your ability modifier to the damage. And... The difference between these two is kind of subtle. So basically, the 5th edition two-weapon fighting rules state that when you make an attack with a light weapon, which is an action, you can then, as a bonus action, make a second attack with a second light weapon. But you do not get to add your ability modifier damage to that second attack. And then the two-weapon fighting style allows you to add your ability modifier damage to that second attack. And this version just allows you to make an attack with a light weapon as a bonus action when you are wielding two weapons. So the big difference here is that, one, you do not need to actually be wielding a uh, light weapon for your main weapon. You can have a regular weapon and a light weapon. Uh, but more importantly, you could hypothetically make the bonus action attack first, and then the regular action attack. Or you could just make the bonus action attack, and then do, like, you know, literally anything else with your action. And finally, we have Wind Up, which I guess kind of replaces great weapon fighting, and allows you to, when wielding a two-handed weapon, select one target as a bonus action, and then uh, double your proficiency bonus on the first attack you make against that uh, target before the end of your turn. So, uh, it functions exactly like aim, 
but for melee attacks. Versus great weapon fighting, which allowed you to reroll ones and twos from the damage of two-handed weapon attacks. And then the only fighting style from the player's handbook that is not represented here is dueling. But other than that, you know, it's just different versions of the fighting styles. And overall, I do like the feeling of these new versions. A lot of them are more active, which is generally a better gameplay experience. However, whether they are better or worse than their 5th edition counterparts... That's, that is a topic for discussion. Aim is arguably about the same. You could argue it's a little worse because you now need to spend a bonus action to specify a target, but it's not that big of a deal, especially at lower levels, because you're probably not going to need to change targets between the point in time at which you designate your target with a bonus action and attack them with your action. And then also only applying to the first attack you make is not that big of a deal because you're not that likely to be making more than one attack. However, once you get to level 5, it changes a bit because now you do have that second attack that this ability will not apply to, but also the bonus increases to plus 3 because it's double your proficiency bonus. So the bonus gets bigger, but... You have to question whether it's worth it when you only get it on one attack. Guard, I would probably call better under the right circumstances. Like, imposing disadvantage on an attack is a significantly better bonus than plus one to your AC. However, in a situation where you are, say, surrounded or fighting an opponent that makes lots of attacks, like a dragon, that plus one to AC against all of the attacks is going to be a lot better than disadvantage on the first one. Quick Strike is universally better. There is uh, no downside to this one, and it actually removes some restrictions from the 5th edition to weapon fighting. And Windup is honestly kind of worse. Uh, first off, Rerolling damage versus getting a bonus on attack, uh, I can't say which of those two is better. It is too much a matter of preference. But what I can say is that ranged and weapon attacks and ranged and weapon fighters function differently. So having the same ability for both of them doesn't make a lot of sense. The big thing being that even at first level, a melee fighter is fairly likely to be making more than one attack per round because of opportunity attacks. And those attacks might happen outside of your turn. So having a bonus that only applies to your next attack and ends at the end of your turn if not used is the sort of thing that is not really as useful for a melee fighter as it would be for a ranged fighter. Like, melee fighters need to get some kind of benefit to make up for the additional risk of using a melee weapon. Especially considering that, you know, ranged characters get to add their dexterity to AC, attacks, and damage while potentially remaining a hundred feet away from the enemies. Like, there have been times, I recall, where I've had archers that have been literally off the board during combat. Because why would you not be up in a tree 100 feet away when you can be up in a tree 100 feet away? So overall, with aim, I would like to either see the bonus made better or that one target restriction be removed. Guard, it's okay. Quick Strike is, you know, actually good. And as for Windup, honestly, might as well just go back to Great Weapon Fighting or, you know, just go back to the drawing board. It clearly needs some more work. At level 2, Action Surge remains unchanged. You get one extra action once per interest period. Although, uh, that is a further reason to remove the one attack restrictions on Aim and Windup. At level 3, you get a Discipline, which is your Martial Archetype, and I will explain those after I explain the other stuff. At levels 4, 6, and 8, you get plus 1 to 1 Ability Score, plus a Martial Talent, which, uh, as mentioned, are like feats, 
except they don't call them that. And I went over the talents in uh, the previous video, but this packet does contain some new and revised ones. So, uh, Artillerist lets you ignore the loading property of simple and martial weapons, so uh, it makes crossbows not useless, but also grants you advantage on attacks with siege weapons. And, uh, are siege weapons considered martial weapons? Are they a thing that fighters are just proficient with by default? Because it doesn't say that it gives you proficiency, just that it gives you advantage. Hand-to-hand -hand is the only revised talent here. It grants proficiency in unarmed strikes, increases the damage of unarmed strikes to 1d6 plus strength modifier, and gives advantage on ability checks to initiate or escape a grapple. And what has changed here is that the version from the previous packet, small creatures, dealt 1d4 plus strength modifier damage with unarmed strikes, and also they made a point of specifying that characters are not proficient with unarmed strikes by default. Uh, apparently they are in 5th edition, but they are not in core fantasy role-playing game. That is the uh, placeholder name that they are using in this playtest. And Physical Prowess lets you increase your strength, con, or dex by one. Uh, and, you know, you also get to increase one of your ability scores by one when you get the talent, so... This one's kind of weird. And then, as mentioned, at level 5, you get a second attack. And uh, I guess that's all of the content for the 8 levels that are provided, except for the uh, disciplines, which I'm going to get into now, and uh, there's a bit to cover there. So the playtest packet provides two fighter disciplines, and first we will look at the Spellblade, which is their version of the Eldritch Knight, and is very similar to the Eldritch Knight. Uh, so you get spellcasting, which is the same as the Eldritch Knights. The biggest difference between the two subclasses being that now you get Enchant Weapon, which allows you to give a weapon a plus one enhancement, instead of Weapon Bond, which allows you to bond with a weapon and then summon that weapon to you and make it undisarmable. So I kind of like the new version better, but maybe that's just because I don't think I've ever actually had a weapon disarmed from me. Like, at any point in years of playing role-playing games. You also gain access to magic talents in addition to martial talents, uh, which is a new ability because, you know, feats weren't a core part of 5th uh, edition. And at level 7, you get Spell Multi-Attack, which achieves the same result as War Magic, allowing you to make a weapon attack and cast a cantrip, but does so through different means, which no longer costs a bonus action, and means that the cantrip or the weapon attack can be made first. And uh, that is it for the Spellblade. There's not a lot in that one. Uh, most of it is, you know, the spell casting, which I just kind of glossed over because... It's the same as in 5th edition. But now we have the Weapon Master, which is their version of the Battle Master, and uh, has a lot more to talk about. So uh, I will start by getting into uh, what's different before I get into what is kind of the same. At 3rd level, you gain Mastery, which allows you to select 3 weapons and gain Mastery in them, giving you the ability to, once per turn, reroll one damage die with one of the mastered weapons and take either result. Which, uh, is a little overpowered, but like, in the fun overpowered way. And then at level 7, your mastered weapons also crit on a 19 or 20 versus the Battle Master, who gain proficiency in a type of artisan tools and a weird ability that allowed you to see if other creatures had more hit points, higher strength, etc. than you. But now onto the main feature, which is stunts, or maneuvers as they were known in 5th edition. And uh, this is the kind of same, but kind of different part. Instead of a stock of D8 superiority dice, you just get a number of stunt points, specifically one plus your proficiency bonus, versus three superiority dice and then an additional one at 7th level and 14th level. 
which does equal more points sooner and more points overall, since it goes up every time your proficiency bonus increases at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17. Stunts cost one point to execute. It is entirely possible that some stunts in the future will cost more than one point to execute, but for now, they are all listed as having a cost of one point. And all of the points are regained after a short rest. You gain three stunts at third level, and then an additional one at seventh level, and then who knows after that, this uh, playtest only goes to level eight, versus the maneuvers, where you got three at third level, but then two more at seventh level, and then the other levels that aren't really relevant for this comparison. There are nine stunts provided in this playtest packet, and... Honestly, I don't really want to go through all of them and compare them to their 5th edition counterparts, but I will because I am a fucking professional. Arcing Stripe replaces Sweeping Attack, allowing you to, when dealing damage with a two-handed slashing weapon, damage a second target within five feet for half of the damage of the initial attack. Versus dealing damage to a second creature within five feet, equal to a roll of the superiority die, and also needing to have been able to hit that second creature with the initial attack. And then Run Through does the same thing, but with a piercing weapon, and makes considerably less sense thematically. Cheap Shot, which as far as I can tell is an original stunt, and allows you to, when hitting a creature with a melee weapon, make an unarmed strike against the target as part of the same attack action. Uh, which is obviously a little worthless if you do not have the hand-to-hand -hand talent. Hobbling Strike also seems to be original and allows you to, when hitting a creature with a weapon attack, forego the damage to instead reduce the creature's speed by half until the start of your next turn. Make It Count replaces Precision Attack, allowing you to make a single weapon attack with a plus 10 bonus, versus adding a superiority die to a weapon attack before or after rolling, so a moderately bigger bonus, but with moderately more restriction. Parry replaces parry, allowing you to use your reaction to reduce the damage of a weapon attack made against you by a creature within 5 feet by 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus versus reducing the damage of a melee attack by your superiority die plus dexterity modifier. And I do want to address the wording on this one, because as written, this version should apply to a ranged attack made by an adjacent creature, but not to an attack made with a reach weapon. And repost replaces... Repost, allowing you to, when missed by a weapon attack from a creature within 5 feet, use your reaction to make a single melee attack against that target with a weapon without the heavy property. Versus, when missed by a melee attack, using a reaction to make a melee weapon attack and add the superiority die to the damage. So, the same changes in the language as parry, but also no longer adds a uh, bonus die to the damage. Shifting Strike seems to be original, allowing you to, when hitting with a slashing melee attack, reposition yourself to one square within five feet of the target. And finally, Sweep the Leg replaces Trip Attack, allowing you to, when hitting a creature no more than one size larger than yourself with a melee weapon, attempt to knock them prone, requiring a strength save or be knocked prone. Versus the same but against a creature of size large or smaller, and adding the superiority die to the damage. So, aside from the loss of the bonus die, now a small creature cannot use this ability on a large creature. So overall, the big thing here is, of course, the loss of the superiority dice, which in some cases are replaced by a different die or static bonus, but in others, particularly those where it's just kind of arbitrarily added to the damage, it's just kind of gone. And that does end up making some of the stunts a little less powerful than their 5th edition equivalents. But I think the more important question is, were those extra dice really necessary, or was it just, the way we have structured this ability, we need to use the superiority die in each of the maneuvers? 
my personal belief is that it's the latter. Also, though, keep in mind that while you are losing bonus damage from some of the stunts, you are also gaining a fairly powerful always-on damage bonus. And that is about it for the disciplines. Overall, you know, they're kinda okay, but you may have noticed they're also really, really similar to uh, the Eldritch Knight and Battlemaster, which, uh, incidentally are not part of the SRD. So, uh, so that means something. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, I got it. That means that, uh, the OGL doesn't matter and never did. And I guess that is also it for the Project Black Flag Playtest Fighter version one. As I said earlier, a lot of redesign restricted by the framework of having to replace things ability for ability. Because, you know, they can't change things that might make the class non-compatible with previous or future Dungeons & Dragons content. Which is really too bad, because I'm liking the kind of things that I'm seeing here. Like, it seems like they've got some good ideas, but are only allowing themselves to implement those ideas in the most surface level way possible. Like, they're not allowing themselves to fix any of the big problems or introduce any new concepts. Like, I mentioned earlier how I would be fine with it only being eight levels, and that is because the 20 level system is actually one of D&D's biggest design flaws. Classes are designed for 20 levels, around half of which are almost never used. So a 10th level character still feels only about half complete because the design focus was on that 20 level stretch. But redesigning the classes so that they focus on the level one to 10 experience that most players have, and then providing a second level 11 to 20 experience for the expert players, is the sort of thing that would be a really good update to Dungeons & Dragons, but also the sort of thing that you cannot do when restricting yourself to working within the existing framework of a specific edition. Like, I've been criticizing the 1 D&D playtest a lot for having design decisions that are obviously and heavily influenced by corporate demands. That's like the big looming issue with that playtest. But Cobalt Press is kind of doing that to themselves. Except that instead of forcing optimization for compatibility with a virtual tabletop, they are forcing optimization for compatibility with a nearly 10-year-old edition of Dungeons and & Dragons. And or an unfinished version of Dungeons & Dragons which is created with the intent of being optimized for a virtual tabletop. Instead of, you know, making a new version of the game that people will want to play for the next 10 years. Like, here's the thing. Pathfinder did not succeed by being better than D&D 4th Edition. It succeeded by being better than D&D 3rd Edition. Like, it wasn't just continuing support for 3rd edition, it was providing a superior 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons experience. And as I said in the last video, a game for people who are currently upset with Wizards of the Coast, but also unwilling to play anything other than D&D, is a niche that only really exists until the Wizards put out something that those people want. And right now, it just kind of seems like they are focusing on being the okayest D&D alternative, and it seems like they're capable of being better than that. And thank you for watching, with extra special thanks to my Fight and Flail Snails, Samuel Gorski, Ranty Maholland, and Toshi Rokuro. If you'd like to be cool like them, you can check out my Patreon, where you can get early access to videos and fun stuff that I make for the Patreon. But if you don't want to do that, that's cool too. You can still hit all the lovely buttons, like, subscribe, these other videos, which either myself or the Cold Heartless YouTube algorithm have lovingly selected for you, which I'm sure are lovely videos that you will also enjoy. And I will see you next time.